Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast, Season 10, Episode 95. He's Dave Bryan, Alex Azor, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for being here this Friday, Steelers Nation. Dave, we have an amazing show today. We have the one, the only, the man, the myth, the, myth, the legend, Dave T. Thomas, on the show. You'll hear that interview shortly, and man, it was a good one. Uh, boy, it certainly was, and every time this year, you know, we start getting the emails, we start getting the, the tweets, where you gotta have Dave T on, and it's hard, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's so amazing to look back over the years, and all the times that we've had him, uh, on, on, on this show, and, and, and the knowledge, and people just cannot seem to get enough of him, and, you know, you just gotta, you, you throw out one name, and you get seven back, mm-hmm. <laughs> and, yep. you know, and, and I think people are really gonna be pleased with uh, uh, with with what all you know with the interview today, I think at what 40, 50 minutes with uh with with Dave Dave T today. So yeah, definitely one of the highlight shows of the year on the Terrible Podcast. Yep, we go through basically every position. We're talking Steelers, we're talking NFL at large, and of course talking about the landscape of the draft this year and how different things are going to be uh, with the coronavirus pushing everything virtually. Just going to spend a couple minutes, you and I, talking about some of the news, I guess, of the day. There really isn't a whole lot to talk about. Terry Bradshaw, though, uh, has kind of made the media rounds, and you know, for as big a critic as he's been um, on on Mike Tomlin, he actually said he did quote a hell of a job. Last year, I don't know if I have the full quote uh, offhand. Immediately, I'll pull it up. But Bradshaw uh, praising Tomlin for trying to, you know, navigate this team, even though it was only to an eight-eight record. Boy, what a weird interview that was uh, yesterday on ninety-three point seven. The fan, he, uh, well, you know, he went from uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, good Terry to uh, get off my lawn, <laughs> <laughs> Terry. A lot of different things in there. Of course, talking about uh, you know his time in you know uh, his relationship with Pittsburgh. You know why he missed uh, or why he didn't go to several of those funerals. You know uh, over the years, and was asked about his thoughts on 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 quarterbacks around the league and and whether or not Ben Roethlisberger or who the greatest quarterback uh, uh, of the Steers all time is. And, you know, he said Ben Roethlisberger. He says, look, I might have more Super Bowls, but, you know, Ben's probably the better quarterback. Uh, he did he did kind of, uh, though, you know, say that, look, you know, if I would have played in those kind of offenses, you know, he kind of pre- defended himself in there. And then, you know, talked about uh, Tom Brady quite a bit in there and, and how he doesn't view him as the greatest of all time. And, you know, uh, and just a, so much in there. And obviously, as you you uh, said, you know, talked about Tomlin and, and, and it really it's lack of relationship with Tomlin and Ben over the years. And and he did praise, you know, Tomlin for the job that he did last season and all. So uh, really so much, you know, uh, uh, in in like, uh, what was that, about 20, 25 minute interview, I think somewhere around uh, uh, that time frame there. But uh, certainly was worth a listen to. Yeah, and he was pretty gracious, saying that Ben Roethlisberger, the best quarterback in Steelers history, uh, he said, quote, I would give it to Ben. I mean, his numbers far exceed mine. I may have more Super Bowls, but he's a much better quarterback. I wasn't bad in my era, but he's big, strong, and accurate, puts up monstrous numbers, and he's won two Super Bowls, and I pass that baton to him gladly. I have absolutely no problem with that. He deserves it. So very gracious from Bradshaw. Do you agree with that assessment? Just, you know, uh, as a third party, do you think that Ben is the, the, the best quarterback in Steelers history? Well, look, I mean, you're talking about two different, I mean— you know, the errors are tough, yeah. The, the tough. errors are tough to – I mean, it, it's so tough to compare the two, right? I mean, mm-hmm. uh, and, you know, thankfully, I, you know, as a child, I watched a lot of, of, of Bradshaw, obviously, growing up and, and through the magic of the Internet and all, been able to go back and watch a lot of games, you know, uh, along with it. And it's you know, just a different era of football. So, you know, it's, it's hard to put – to pit one against the other and say – you know, one's greater than the other. Now, obviously, from a statistical standpoint, I mean, Brad, I mean, uh, 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 Ben's going to be the better quarterback, right? You sure. Know? Yeah. Uh, but uh, boy, when you look at, at at during his era, 
uh, talking about Bradshaw, I mean, it, it was Bradshaw, it was Stallback, you know, those, those were the guys, you know, Bradshaw was able to, uh, to to do a lot of things, was able to push the football down the field, obviously had a lot of great receivers to throw to uh, on top of it, and had a great running game, a great offensive line, so it's one of those questions that I, I think we're going to be peppered with from, 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 from forever here, mm-hmm. you know, as long as we're alive, who was the better quarterback there, and I, I just think because of the different eras and the way – because look, look at the way the game was played back when when when, when Bradshaw played and and really you know didn't change until the uh, the Mel Blunt rule and all like that because you know back then they could manhandle those wide receivers right, you know right. and 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 now they obviously can't uh, can't do that kind of stuff there so you know I, I'm not chickening out on this I just I think it's an impossible. You know, I think you have to look at the quarterback in the era that he played, and then go apples to apples, oranges mm-hmm. to oranges. You know, well, when it comes to uh, put putting a measure measuring stick on them. That's fair. I mean, yeah, there's no wrong answer here. I would give the edge to Ben. Of course, I am a little biased because I grew up watching Ben. Obviously, I didn't see Bradshaw live and in person. I guess for me, the difference is just how tough of a start Bradshaw's career was. Now, granted, that was a worse team, a different era, the rocky relationship with Chuck Nolan and the, the high expectations he had. But, you know, Ben Rosberger never got benched for, for Terry, Terry Hanratty, you know, so I just kind of look at, you know, Ben really made that impact immediately. And again, different circumstances, Ben was on a much better team than Bradshaw was in those early years. But to me, that's, I think, the slight difference that pushes Ben ahead of Bradshaw. And uh, and that's fair, you know, but I mean, uh, one has four Super Bowl. <laughs> yeah, that, that would be the, the, the counterpoint to Bradshaw, sure. You know, you can really go scoreboard there uh, uh, mm-hmm. that way. But I mean, it, just a different era and all. And what, what did, did you listen to the full interview? Uh, what, what were your overarching thoughts of Terry throughout the interview? Well, I mainly just was reading off the what you guys had, uh, had written. Um, I listened to a little bit of it, but yeah, I mean, it was it was just kind of classic Terry, that kind of bigger personality, just gonna tell you exactly how he feels and what's on his mind. I love that he dropped a Bobby Lane reference because I think Bobby Lane's the third best quarterback. I think you know, regardless of where you debate Bradshaw versus Ben, in third place, hundred percent should be Bobby Lane. So I love that he just threw that that guy in there, just a very old school player with a, a ton. There's a ton of good stories about Bobby Lane in his in his heyday. So yeah, it was just kind of classic Bradshaw. Do you think there's still some animosity somehow? I mean, he claims that there's not with the city of Pittsburgh and the reason why he left the way he did. Do you think there's some, uh, I don't know, I don't want to say jealousy. Maybe it is jealousy. Do you think there's just something in there still? Yeah, I think so. Even when he was talking about Tomlin, you can kind of see there's a little passive aggressiveness, a little bit of a grudge. He says, well, I don't know Mike Tomlin. Retro did quote, I called Mike Tomlin twice, never returned my phone calls. And so I asked Jay Glazer to give me his number. I wanted to talk to him. I never heard from him. So that's cool. He's a head coach. I don't have a problem with that. There's a little bit of of something there. I, I don't know if it's jealousy, maybe just a grudge, maybe just the animosity that you mentioned. But yeah, I don't think everything, I don't think all those bridges have been rebuilt. I, I don't think so either. But look, I mean, Terry is Terry and he's got uh, you know he's got a tough job of, of being uh, an analyst as long as he's been in the NFL and 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 trying to uh, skirt that line of, of being a former player for a certain you know great organization and yet still having to uh, you know be objective enough to be mm-hmm. to be critical you know uh, really old man Terry came out quite a bit you know in, in, in that interview yesterday as well too talk about you know just not liking the coaching style of, of, of Tom and the chest bumping and uh, you know that you know he, he said look you know I, I I played for a coach in Chuck Noll that was a no nonsense coach he says can, can you imagine me after a touchdown running over to the sideline and mm-hmm. and, 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 and doing a chest bump with, with Chuck Noll. No, no, we can't. But <laughs> right. that doesn't mean that, that that Tomlin's coaching style is wrong. It's just entirely different from what you know Terry dealt with during his NFL career. Mm-hmm. And that makes sense. It gives me kind of more clarity. So I'm glad that Bradshaw said that because I never really considered that. But yeah, obviously, you know, Bradshaw's perspective and point of view and the way that he grew up playing the game was different because he played for a different style of coach. So I think that was good information and just to kind of let me get in Bradshaw's head and understand his perspective when he talks about Mike Tomlin because he's a very different guy than, as Bradshaw said, the coach he played for. Right. And uh, anyway, if those of you listening to this podcast haven't heard it, uh, you know, obviously you can hear that on the 93.7, the fan website or or on really most of the post on SteelersDepot.com about Bradshaw. We have the included embedded uh, mm-hmm. link to the audio in that as well, too. But uh, entertaining, to say the least.
Absolutely. Anything else you want to talk about, Dave, before we jump into Dave T's uh, discussion? No, they didn't come here. Uh, they're not listening today, <laughs> really, to hear us. They scrolled past this. They scrubbed through it. <laughs> yeah, uh, they uh, they probably didn't even hear. They probably fast forwarded right, right, you know, uh, uh, fast forwarded to the Dave mm-hmm. T part portion of it, and and uh, we wouldn't blame them if they did. Look, I mean, this is a monumental, uh, you know, podcast every year for us. So I guess with that, uh, we should get to uh, Dave T, right? Yep, let's do it. Let's have our discussion with Dave T. Thomas. Okay, welcome back. Uh, as usual, it's our annual pre-draft podcast with the great Dave T. Thomas. Uh, Dave has been on the show now. It's either 10 or 11 years. I don't know where the time time has gone with this, but uh, Dave now has uh, his own podcast uh, called Scouts Honor. When we bring him on, we'll have him uh, talk a little bit about that and something else he's got going on uh, uh, related to that. So without further ado, I am pleased to announce that uh, we're having back on the show Dave T. Thomas. Dave, welcome back. Hey, I think we're probably pushing 11 years because I just took off my socks. I counted my toes, and I saw that I had a Pittsburgh Steeler uh, sticker on each toe. So it must be 11. <laughs> it, it, it must be, Dave. It's incredible. You know, look back at all the great episodes we have. And, boy, when it gets to this time of year, uh, we start getting the emails, and we start getting the the uh, the, uh, the tweets on Twitter. Hey, when are you going to have Dave T on? So uh, today is indeed our day. I think Alex and I just got done uh, buckling up there. So why while we, while we cinch these seat belts real tight, tell us a little bit about the podcast and the other promotion that you got going on. CNN's Paul Crane and I decided to start it a couple of years ago. We were dealing mostly down south. Uh, Paul does the uh, broadcast of the Atlanta Falcons uh, radio network. Uh, when the coronavirus hit, we went full-time with this thing. Why? Because people are going stir-crazy at home. Instead of sitting there and saying yes, dear, to your wife 30 times a day, at least people could come over and listen from a scout's point of view, not a draft point of view. I'm an anti I draft analyst, but I want people to know the process going through with the draft, how the scouts are dealing with the new issues they'll be here, and how the scouts are becoming more important. Not only do we have players on, not only do we have other experts on, but we started another thing too, which is weekly. We bring one fan on and have him sit on with the whole show to get the fan's point of view of what's going on out there. In other words, consider ourselves your professor. That's good stuff. And and tell, you know, and, and you and I talked briefly when when I uh, called yesterday. Uh, tell us a little bit about the trials and tribulations and, and how teams are going to be relying a little bit more on on uh, the scouting department this year with the coronavirus and all. Give, give, me, uh, give me that rundown that you, uh, that you gave me yesterday. Well, I blame the NFL office. They turned the draft into an incredible circus. I mean, at least out at Las Vegas right now, you're going to have to wait a year for the Ferris wheel to show up. But (laughs) even in the scouting industry, it seems that the teams that were in Boy Scouts were caught with their pants down. Look, we had six teams not even send their coaches to the combine. And usually you rely on the combine, even if it's only a 10-minute brief interview with the kid. You watch him go through his underwear drills. Then you go to Pro Day and you interview the kids there. There's no more Pro Day. So now all of a sudden they have to deal with video over here. Now all of a sudden that scout that's seen the players for four years out there makes a more important value to himself because now a position coach has to get a hold with that scout, sit down with the scout, and go along with the talent. Because if not, the only I see that a coach is going to have to make his determination is by video. Tape. All right, so uh, with that, let's jump in. Uh, give us some of the, uh, uh, you know, I, there's never a starting place with you, and there's never an <laughs> ending place. Well, uh, let me just give uh, out this, place well, Go ahead. before we forget, let me give out this thing. Folks, whatever question you got, whatever tirade you got, I want to hear about. Go to Scouts Honor Podcast uh, 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 at gmail.com I will answer any question you have even on how to make a proper egg for your little kid in the morning while the wife's still asleep that's that that's good so make sure to get uh, all your your, your question we'll make sure to uh, to give out that email address at the end of the show so what are you hearing let, let here's a starting point for you what are you hearing concerning the Pittsburgh Steelers concerning this 2020 draft 
Well, the biggest concern I have is that they let Hargrave walk out the door. You look at their tradition at Nosegod, Casey Hampton, Steve McClendon, Hargrave following him up. The key to their defense has always been that man in the middle that could clog the rushing lanes while your other defensive linemen and your edge rushers are having success. Uh, Boy, I I think that the biggest loss I've ever seen from Pittsburgh in the last five years is losing Hargraves out there. I guess Pittsburgh not only didn't want to spend the money, but guys, there's $6 million over the cap right now. What are you going to do to fill that nose guard spot? Oh, boy, do I got a kid from Baylor that might be sitting there in round three that could be the next Casey Hampton. And he is. I think I had him in my last mock draft. Tell us a little bit about him. Bravion Roy, you look at that kid, he's short, he's squat, he's fat, he's got arms like T-Rex, but boy, oh boy, that kid produces out there on the football field, guys. I look at this guy, what he could do out there. I mean, you you look at the system, look at what he's done just grade-wise. I mean, an 88.4 overall grade. If you convert that to what went on in uh, the NFL last year, that is the fifth highest grade of any interior defensive lineman that played in the NFL last year. His 85.6 run defense grade, that would have made him the third highest run defense grader among all NFL interior uh, defenders. His 83.7 pass rushing grade, that would have made him sixth among them all. That's the type of guy that if you come up in round three, you know that the nose guards are the type out there that's sort of like the offensive lineman. They don't get any recognition because they don't have the heavy uh, stats. But here's a kid that on 29 running plays against him last year, teams averaged 0.46 yards against this guy. Six sacks, 30 quarterback pressures. 15 quarterback hits, and this was on 726 plays. On top of that, the kid lifts, uh, you know, he could relieve Charles Atlas of holding up the uh, globe. <laughs> You're going into this draft without a first rounder, but people say, oh, they don't have a first rounder. I says, you take Jeff Okadub right now. You take any two say uh, defensive backs in this draft, they don't equal up to what Fitzpatrick does on the football field. Real quick with Roy, I had him, uh, I, I, I came across him last week and watched a little bit of tape on him, and, and I have him as a fifth or sixth round grade. What kind of, what round grade do you have on Roy? I got him as uh, a late two, early three. You, you know, you look at the guy on the eye chart on the film, you say, nah, you know, he doesn't look like uh, what we want over there, the lack of length and everything else. Oh, boy, but, man, could he turn around and scare any running back running up. Look at the quickness on this guy, 501 speed and a 40-yard dash. He simply abused centers last year, especially when playing head up. 725 snaps, that's quite a bit of his snaps for a nose tackle. When you look at this guy, I mean, you look at a guy that is a big, fat boy, and that's what I want in the middle. Remember what Casey looked like. I mean, you know, he wasn't exactly going to get on the cover of a GQ magazine. (laughs) The big knock against him, though, is the 30-inch arm length. But I say if you got your hands on that center and you're tossing him to the ground, it doesn't matter if you've got an extra two inches. This kid is the type of guy that I want bull rushing. I mean, six sacks last year, that shows what he could do. He doesn't have much versatility as far as moving into a 4-3 to play a 3-tech or a 5-tech, but the system that Pittsburgh runs right now, everything goes through the nose guard occupying more than one off, uh, offensive lineman. Well, Dave T., you're speaking my language because I've talked about the need for a nose tackle for a long time because you're playing in AFC North, Baltimore, and Cleveland, Cincinnati, teams that are going to run the football all day. Um, if not Roy, who are some other options potentially as a nose tackle? Maybe someone in that more Hargrave mold, a little more versatile, a little more athletic, someone like Gallimore, Blacklock, Matabuke. Is there anyone else besides Roy that you think could be that fit on day two, day three? You know, I look at Gallimore, his production doesn't equal what his athletic ability has on the field. I know a lot of teams have him as a second-round draft pick, but I tell the 31 other teams, if I was the Steelers, go ahead and take the guy. We'll wait till round three. Right now, from what I'm looking at, all of the nose guards coming out in this draft, I'm saying strictly nose guard, Roy is probably going to be the guy to bring the best production on the football field. 
Go ahead, Dave. All right. Uh, yeah, let's see. Uh, let's move to offensive line here because the Steelers obviously Ramon Foster retired. B.J. Finney, uh, backup uh, center slash guard, you know, uh, uh, left the free agency there. They might move. Sounds like they might move Matt Filer over. Of course, they brought in uh, Stefan Wiz- uh, Wisniewski to to compete for that spot as well too. Tell us some. Uh, tell us about some left guard or guard capable. You know, and maybe center types. Talk about the interior offensive linemen uh, when it comes to the Steelers in this draft. If he did not suffer the knee injury in the season finale, this kid probably would have gone in the third round, will probably be out there in the sixth or seventh round. Look at uh, Indiana's right offensive guard, Simon Stepaniak. This guy lifts the weight room. He proved that at the combine, showing up with a brace two days after having surgery on his knee. He shows up at the combines and puts up the weights 37 times. You go back and look at what he did in school. This is a kid with 124 knockdown blocks last year, 19 touchdown resulting blocks combined, 12 of them were for the ground game. You look at what Pittsburgh has. They like you lose, using those big boys in the backfield, having this guy opening the, uh, the plays with 5-1 speed out there. We know that he could trap and pull. This is the type of guy when you're coming up at the tail end of the draft, you go WTF, what do I have to lose on this guy? Talk about uh, Cesar Ruiz and and Cushenberry near the top of the the class. Oh, I hate Cushenberry. A matter of fact, uh, I I think that LSU, outside of Jefferson, outside of Patrick Queen, outside of Rashawn Lawrence and Damian Lewis, I think you're going to see a lot of disappointment from general managers, possibly even firings for drafting an LSU player. Uh, No knock on Burrow. Burrow's not my top quarterback. I I look at Burrow as being more of a Ryan Tannehill type of guy. But when I'm sitting out there and I need a guard uh, more than a center, I'm looking at Ruiz. I think he's probably better suited to play guard. Lewis is another guy that I'll probably find out there in the third round that I could bring in and plug at right guard. Wisniewski, to me, is a good number six guy. I could use him to back up both of my guards and my center. However, remember one thing. Clock is ticking over here. Both Alejandro uh, Villanueva and Filer, both of these guys are in the final year of their contracts. Um, Dave, Dave, T, you still is really prized versatility in the draft. Who do you think are some of the more versatile linemen in the draft? I'm not just saying this one guy, but like a guy like Calvin Stock Morton from Oregon, a guy that's played all over. Who are some of the, those guys that wore a lot of hats in, in college? Oh, probably the best offensive lineman and the most versatile offensive lineman. You're never even going to get a chance to get him unless the Roonies turn around and rob a bank and pay somebody, and that's Tristan Wirfs. Okay. Now, you're going down later in the draft, and you're looking mm-hmm. at some of the offensive linemen over there. I want, it, It's a tackle-rich draft, but I'll tell you right. honestly, I look at the guards and I look at the centers over here, maybe a handful going in day two, but most of those guys look like day three guys on me. Now, one kid I like is in the state of Pennsylvania itself, and that's Matt Hennessy. He's my top-rated mm-hmm. center. However, he has the experience to play guard. Uh, he's a good physical type. Has great lateral agility, knows how to get out in front on on the on his run blocking skills, and this kid is picture perfect. I had three gra- games this year where I graded him 100, percent and I am wow. one tough grader. Wow, yeah, uh, he had a great Senior Bowl week, and I remember you guys talking about the uh, Temple kid last year, Rocky Sin, and how he could have been a Steeler, and obviously that may have happened had the Steelers not traded up for Devin Bush. One more question with the offensive line. I'll flip it back over to Dave. As you said, Dave T, it's a tackle-rich class. How many guys do you think go in the first round? What are guys like Josh Jones and Matt Pert and Ezra Cleveland? Are they borderline first-round guys behind those top names? Uh, Ezra Cleveland is probably the guy getting the most attention right now with the teams mm-hmm. that are at the tail end of round one. Me, uh, Werfs is my number one guy at any of the offensive line positions. My second best tackle out there, that's Andrew Thomas. He is the most consistent player at the position we've seen. And this is a four-year starter. I think a little luster has come off of him because we've examined him since day one. Now all of a sudden these other guys come up. But I tell you, anyone that drafts Mackie Beckton over here, not only do they need two dining rooms, one just for him to eat over there, but they are wasting their first-round draft pick on this guy. 
guy. I know that the Giants right now are number four are clamoring for him, but the coaching staff over there is pulling more for worse. Now, we're probably going to have a situation where they're going to be sitting out there with Isaiah Simmons and the need for an offensive tackle on the board mm-hmm. at number four. With Dave Gettleman's uh, process over here, I say he goes offensive lineman and causes quite a few teams to try to trade up between five and ten to take Simmons. Hell, uh, I, I know that Miami right now, if Simmons slides the number five, they'll wait to get a quarterback with one of their other two first-round draft picks. Dave T., a lot of our listeners, uh, a lot of Steeler fans are wanting the team to draft another running back this year because of the uh, you know, the current state of the depth chart, James Conner, uh, inability to, to, uh, to you know, stay healthy for a full season and all. Alex and I are, aren't so much on that train. However, we both agree that if the Steelers do draft one, they need to draft one early uh, this no, year. No, 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 lover boy, because okay. there is a kid that is going to be sitting out there in day three that I am telling people it will outproduce James Conner. Kid's name is Patrick Taylor out of Memphis. This was a kid that led in 2018 along with their two other great running backs over there, Pollard and Henderson, three guys over a thousand yards rushing. He was supposed to be the feature back this year. Got hurt in the season opener. Didn't come back till the end of the season. Not only did he test well at the combines, this is a 240 pound guy with four five speed watch what some team gets him in round five round six and i guarantee you that by mid-season he's starting patrick taylor right patrick well not only that you go up in the third round you might still even find acres on the board i i think that the little scat backs are going to go early except for jonathan taylor taylor is my top rated running back i know a lot of people have more uh how could i put it Love for uh, DeAndre Swift, but I look at Swift over here. You really haven't produced much in college, and I don't know. I, a potential to me is like kissing your sister for more than thirty seconds. Everybody else in the room is going to get queasy. <laughs> I like the big. I like the big running backs. I think that the big running backs, especially in this day and age over here, yes, they will get banged up, but before they get banged up, they're going to bang up a few people along the way. How, how many how many running backs are you you know Taylor you said Jonathan Taylor is your top back here uh, is he going to go in the first round and who 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 are the uh, uh, run run through your top five in order well well I'm looking at Jonathan Taylor as either being a Green Bay Packer or being a Kansas City Chief in the first round All right, so I think that. Swift has the potential if Green Bay ends up taking Taylor Swift, then will more than likely go to Kansas City because they like the speed factor. I think with all those speedsters they have there right now, if Taylor slides down to number 32, he's, his, he's the man. I love that Larry kid out of uh, LSU. I think that kid right now is the second coming to Alvin Kamara. I look at the other running backs out there. Akers is my boy and a surprise guy that may even slide into round three because of the knee issues is Zach Moss out of Utah. Okay. Uh, You mentioned Patrick Taylor from Memphis. How about the other Memphis kid? He's kind of a hybrid guy, Antonio Gibson, receiver, running back, return man. What's your take on him? I think if you take a guy like that, you use him out of the backfield on the short passing area. I think when you're looking for a jackknife type, he's the guy. Now, however, if you wait to round six, round seven, you'll have the most perfect gadget guy in this draft, and that's Navy quarterback Malcolm Perry. Three 1,000-yard seasons. Last year, he ran for 2,100 yards. Not only that is, he's a quality receiver. We saw that down at the East-West game when they tried to move him to a receiver. And besides, look at it over there. I mean, Heinz Ward, uh, uh, Antoine Randall L., they were down there coaching in the game. They were following the kid around like they were his little puppy dogs. <laughs> My gut feeling is Perry, if Perry does not end up wearing a New England uniform, he will probably be a, a change of pace guys for you guys with the Steelers. Wow. That's how much impression he made on those coaches. Wow. Yeah, but the, the Patriots took that uh, Cardona, the long snapper service guy uh, a couple years ago, so I could see that. Dave, you, you had a question? 
Uh, yeah, the wide receiver class, Dave. Uh, boy, when, when you when you when you look at this class, I, I don't know where it ranks in the years that you've done uh, uh, done this, but it definitely is an impressive class. Uh, tell us about some. And look, the Steelers have drafted a wide receiver. It seems like uh, uh, almost every year for the last twenty years. Uh, there's very few years in there that they have not drafted one. So odds are good they're going to draft one. Uh, to talk about a few of these. To talk about the overall uh, makeup of this class. And two, tell us a couple of the guys that you see second, third, fourth round potentially with the Steelers. Well, one, two, three, more likely to the Jets at 11, 12, and 13 in the draft is going to be C.D. Lamb, Ruggs, and then Judy. However, I'm looking at the possession type guys, physicality type later in round one. I got to look at Jefferson. Now, in round two, you got to look at the injury factor. Brandon Ioke out of uh, Arizona State just had core muscle surgery without going out there and seeing the kid without getting a clean physical because the kid might not be ready till training camp. This is a guy that will end up going into, you know, the second, third round area. Chenault, too. You look at Chenault over at. Uh, uh, what do you call it, Colorado, he's coming off of surgery. He could slide as far into the day three action. K.J. Hamler, uh, the little scat back over at Penn State, this is a guy that a lot of teams are looking at more likely in round two itself. It is a plethora of wide receivers out there, but I got a sleeper for you, and I know that the, that the Steelers have done a lot of homework on him, and I bet you he's there in day three for them. Everybody went in to see Juwan uh, Jennings over at Tennessee. Everybody fell in love with their split end over there, Marquise Calloway. Kid out of Georgia, went to Tennessee. I liken him to Kenny Galladay. And we've seen what Kenny Galladay has done. I liken his speed to Darius Slayton and look at the steal that the Giants got in the fifth round with Slayton. All right, uh, Mike, you know, Michael Pittman uh, out of USC seems to be getting a, a lot of run uh, of late. What are your thoughts on, on Pittman, Denzel Mims, and Jalen Ray, Ray, uh, uh, Rager? I don't think Denzel Mims will get past the Patriots if all of the quarterbacks are off the board. Mims is the type of guy that, how can I put it, he's hanging out with Drew Carey when they're playing the little yodel machine. Every time I look at him, he's taking another step up the, the, the ratings charts. Pittman, Chase Claypool, if people don't take these two guys in the second round, they're nuts. Both of these guys are physical types. Me, I'm more of a Chase Claypool type because if I use guys at multi-positions over here, I could play him as a motion uh, tight end. I could play him in a slot even though at his size. I mean, imagine that little slot cornerback all of a sudden looking up and seeing a six foot four guy, 220 pounds coming down on you. That's when the guy is calling Affleck to make sure his insurance is up to date. All right, two others. Jalen Rager out of TCU. Give us your thoughts on him and Devin DuVernay out of Texas. If you take Jalen Rager over here, you're going to end up eventually having the next Antonio Brown in the locker room. Wow. Mm. And who is the other guy? Uh, Devin DuVernay out of Texas. Speed merchant. That's what he really is. He still needs to learn how to run routes, but if he's going to be the type of guy that you need to get down deep, he'll do it for you. I'm just concerned with his lack of ball concentration. He did have eight drops last year. That's quite a bit for a wide receiver. What round do you have, uh, DuVernay? What grade on him? Uh, I have him in the third round. I figured he's probably going to go there because people are going to become enamored with his speed. Same thing, too, is he adds a little bit to his resume because he can return kicks and punts for you. Okay. Uh, one other receiver, and you mentioned him a, a moment ago, Dave. He also, by the way, that was a solid Price is Right reference you made with Denzel Mims <laughs> after that one. Uh, with Jawan Jennings, how do you juggle the, the size? He's so hard to bring down to open field. Good tape, but a 4-7 guy. Not many receivers who have run 4-7-2, succeed in the NFL. What do you come in on Jawan Jennings? When he left Tennessee's locker room, they gave him a standing ovation for get the hell out of here. <laughs> All right. Fair well, enough. You know, you look at the wide receivers, you see a lot of prima donnas, uh, mm -hmm. him. I, I look at him. I look at Rager. They're not guys that have one in there that's going to give me the full team effort. Sure. They're going to be the types going, why don't you throw to me? Why don't you throw to me? I've had enough of Antonio Brown's Terrell Owens types. Come yeah. on, get out on the field and play. But no matter what, guys, you've got to understand one thing. There's no OTAs. There's no mini camps. More mm -hmm. than likely, not even a rookie camp over here. Whoever you draft 
consider it a red shirt year, especially at wide receiver, because I think wide receivers are more overwhelmed by the playbook when they show up to their team complex among the rookies. And that's why you don't see those rookie wide receivers till the second half of the season. Go look at Tennessee with A.J. Brown, the second half of the year over here. He was fantasy football stalling. Mm-hmm. That's a great point. Uh, definitely good perspective. Another position that's probably overwhelming is tight end. Overall, what do you make of this class? Clearly not a banner class. Is there any talent at tight end that you do like, though? Ha <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no. Now, if I need an H-back type, at day three, I'm looking at that kid from Cincinnati, Josiah DeGora. I think mm-hmm. this kid is Aaron Hernandez without the off-field problems. As far as another sleeper late in the draft, the guy that ended up rupturing his eye at the Combines, Mitch Wilcox down at uh, South Florida. The other guys over here, I wouldn't touch any tight end, even if I needed a tight end till round four at the least, and commit from Notre Dame is my tight end reluctantly at the top of my board. That's how bad the class is. Offensive oh. guard, tight end, they're the worst classes that we're going to see. Wow. Now, one thing I do want to bring up over here, look what's going on with college right now. What happens if college says in June, hey, guys, we're not going to be able to have a season? Understand that there's a second phase of the draft in the NFL called the supplemental draft. Imagine how many of those kids all of a sudden will apply for the supplemental draft. I know the Pittsburgh Steelers general manager wanted three extra rounds in this draft because of their lack of evaluation skills due to the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. Imagine what happens when the supplemental draft, instead of having three or four guys, has 30 or 40 guys in it. Yeah, that would be unprecedented. Sticking with tight end, one last question. I I know you're down on the class, but who are just the best kind of pure blocking tight ends, whether you're talking maybe Sean McCune from Michigan, Dave's guy, Charlie Warner from Georgia, any guys that just fit really well as that block first and second type of mold? A uh, paisan of mine uh, up at one of the small Michigan schools. I believe it's Eastern Michigan. Uh, 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 Giovanni Ricci. He's probably the best block and tight end out there, and he's only 238 pounds. Wow. Okay. This cool. is the type of guy that not only could I use him blocking at the tight end position, if I need a lead blocker coming out of the backfield, he excels at that too. His blocking consistency grade was the highest among all of the tight ends eligible for the draft right now. As a matter of fact, he's the first blocking tight end to receive a blocking consistency grade of over 90% in the last three years. Dave, uh, one of the most polarizing players, I think, this year when it comes to maybe some discussions Alex and I have had uh, is Josh Uche out of Michigan. Uh, you know, a lot of people list him as an edge. Some people say he's too light, going to have to play off the ball. Uh, he obviously you know, ha- uh, uh, registered the sack totals there, a lot of them inside sacks, a lot of blitz sacks and all. Uh, but they did play him a little off the ball. Uh, they did have him drop in coverage a little bit on top of that. What what is what is what are you hearing about Josh Uche? Is he an edge? Is he an off the ball player? Is he just a virtual chess piece? And is second round too early for him? Oh my God! You take him in the second round over here. You better just go ahead and get a hold of your general manager and say, "Hey, here's the Mayflower movers," because you're going to be out of that office pretty soon. I look at this kid. <laughs> say, is... Hey, say that again. <laughs> <laughs> get a hold of Mayflower, brother man. If you're that general manager that takes him anything earlier than the fourth round of the draft, and even then, I would put cautionary tale on him. I mean, this is a kid that just didn't come into his own till this year. Three years sitting on the sidelines. Now you're looking at Jimmy Harbaugh. You think if you had a quality player out there that you would keep him with the cleanest uniform on your team? He had to play him out of desperation this year because they lost Chase Winovich to, uh, to, uh, to the previous draft to the Patriots. I look at Uche right now. He'll have to play in the second level. I look at him if he plays in the second level. Nothing more than, how could I put it, a two down type. Okay. Uh, what about the other edge guys? Steelers love their pass rushes to be big. We're looking at guys like Curtis Weaver from Boise State, Daryl Taylor from Tennessee, who are some of maybe the bigger potential edge rushers. And do you think this is a good edge class? Kevin Colbert called it unusually strong. I didn't quite see it, but where do you weigh in? I think our problem is is that uh, you know we're still trying to adjust ourselves. Uh, you go back a couple of years ago, those edge rushes were called tweeners. Now all mm-hmm. of a sudden they're popping up all over the place, like my apartment house in uh, in New York, where the cockroaches are all over when I turn the lights <laughs> on. That's how I look at these edge rushes. 
Right now, unless you get Chase Young, I say that the best edge rusher combination linebacker over there. And you got to look at the situation, too. By that, if I'll be there at number 49, but Zach Bond brings so much intelligence, so much athleticism, so much production, especially as an edge rusher, along with his ability to play inside linebacker in a 3-4. I mean, if I was a team coming up in the mid-first round, I'd pop on him in a nanosecond. Yeah, uh, Steelers, Wisconsin guys, they've had good success there. Uh, what about inside linebacker? Who is some of the better cover inside linebackers? We know coverage is so important for that group. Maybe guys like Logan Wilson from Wyoming, Akeem Davis-Gaither from App State, and obviously some of the top guys like Murray, Queen, Simmons. I mean, who are, who are your top cover off-ball linebackers? Yeah, but Gaither is 200 pounds over here, so unless I'm going to be sitting him next to my nose guard at the dining room mm-hmm. table, i got to make sure that he eats. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, to me, the best middle linebacker period is Patrick Queen from LSU. You get this guy, you got a guy that will give you Debrick Brooks type of production out there on the football field. Right behind him, and it's a surprise, but I know quite a few teams at the end of round one are looking at him, Jordan Brooks out of Texas Tech. Wow. That's another guy that I'm very, very high on. Uh, real quick on Queen, is there any, because sometimes these off the ball linebackers get kind of, you know, pushed down a little bit for whatever. Is there any chance he slides down to forty nine, or is he going to be off the board uh, by the time the Steelers pick in the second round? Oh, no way he gets out of round one. I would say that he's the first middle linebacker taken. All right, There's and- some people are saying Kenneth Murray, but I look at Kenneth Murray, he doesn't hold the jock strap that Qua Queen could do on the field. You look at LSU winning the championship, everything was on Burrow, the wide receivers. You go to the defense, it was Patrick Queen keeping that, how could I put it? That defense reminds me of the little Dutch boy at the uh, dike that's leaking and using the Band-Aid to plug the hole. Outside of Queen, outside of uh, the defensive tackle Lawrence, I wouldn't touch any of those guys on defense. All right, another little, po- another polarizing kind of guy, depending on who you talk. Uh, Willie Gay, uh, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the off the ball, uh, good, good on the field, not so great off the field. Where, where do you come in on Gay? Oh, well, he does what perfect does on the field. He does that in the locker room. You do got to understand one thing. The kid has an anxiety issue, so, you know, he'll He'll play 100% on the field. My problem is when he gets in the locker room, he <laughs> seems to want to attack his quarterbacks. Too much. Right. And that wasn't the first incident, you know, last mm-hmm. year. Uh, you also go back and look at the cheating scandal that went right. on there that cost them five games. Uh, Gay's the type of guy I bring in, but I tell him right now, listen, come here, son. Zip, zip. I'm putting duct tape on his mouth. All right, and 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 closing out the edges real quick. Uh, both of the Florida kids, Jonathan Greenard and uh, Jabari Zanigua. Uh, Greenard to me is more of a run stuff in defensive end. However, Zaniga, this is the type of guy that plays the cannibal road when it comes to getting to the quarterback. I mean, four or five speed. God bless him. At 265 pounds. I see Zaniga probably as a third-round steal for somebody. That'll look nice at 102, don't you think? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, and, and talk about the Boise State kid, Curtis Weaver. Weaver is the type for me that I need to use him like they use Bruce Irvin. Some teams like him as a middle linebacker, you know, or a strong side linebacker in a 3-4. I think his best ability is with his hands, and that's coming off the line of scrimmage. But like Irvin, he's a two-down type. Now, you look at what's going on out there. I love Taylor. I think Taylor will be a great third-round find for any team as far as going on the edge goes. Big physical type of kid. You know, he did have some injury issues last year, but 270 pounds, runs a four five seven, Late two, early three, I see on Taylor. Alex, i got to adjust my seatbelt and go up for air. <laughs> well, i got a guy right now that is probably my biggest sleeper on the board, and that's the kid out of Charlotte, Alex Highsmith. Uh, I had pegged him as a four going into the postseason, but he excelled in the bowl games, proven that coming out of Conference USA and everything else, there might be some hidden talent over there. Alex Highsmith, I look at him right now. Well, you look at what you got in Fowler. I say right now Highsmith is better than what Fowler is right now. 
I bet Alex has a safety question for you. I I do have a say. I got a couple safety questions. I want to talk. Well, about- if it starts with Kyle Duggar or Anton Winfield, I'll agree with you. But if you got any other safeties rated ahead of those two, I'm going to tell you, Bubba, turn your seat around right now. <laughs> All right, I'll keep my seat straight ahead. But two other guys, maybe below those two, but guys that have had injuries, haven't been able to always work in the pre-draft process, but apparently have, I think Brandon Jones from Texas has reportedly blown teams away with his football IQ, his preparedness, and Ashton Davis from Cal, who's been limited. But I thought I had a great game against Oregon, for example. What about Brandon Jones, Ashton Davis? Do you like those guys? Maybe not as much as Duggar and Winfield, but do you still like them as maybe day two candidates? Oh, yeah. I mean, Davis is going to be off the board in the second round. Some people say third. I say no, no, love a boy on that. Four to eight speed on this guy. He's the best athlete on the football field itself. Another kid I like, but he's banged up. You could probably steal him on day three, and that's Brandon Jones out of Texas. You you look at Jarius Sneed out of Louisiana Tech. This is going to be a good day three find if you're playing slot corner or that extra safety type. And don't discount Kevon Wallace. I see a lot of people People have him late day three. I think he's going to sneak uh, that Clemson kid's going to sneak into the fourth round of the draft. Yeah, and we've talked about Wallace a ton on the podcast. I asked some fans some questions on Twitter to, to ask you uh, questions, Dave T. I have one here from Michael Adesso. He says, uh, Alex, can you please ask Dave T. Who's the best free safety in the Steelers range to draft that can let Minka play all over? So who are the rangy free safety types that fit Pittsburgh? The next Tony Badger, and I even told this kid 20 years from now I'll see you in Canton. It's Antoine Winfield Jr. This kid played cover two linebacker. He played strong safety. He played free safety. He played cornerback last year. The eyes have it, and that's what this kid has. The instincts he has. He's much stronger than his five foot nine, two hundred three uh, mm-hmm. uh, pound frame looks like. But this is a kid I can move around the board. He's my checkerboard piece. Any chance he's there at 49ers, he first round guy? Um, more than likely, it wouldn't surprise me if he ends up 19 with the silver and black. They're really high in them. And watch wow. the silver and black this year. The silver and black are going to do one thing and one thing only. They're going to draft for need. I see them going after Alex Highsmith in the second round. Imagine wow. Alex and Max out there as your edge rushers. Oh, my God, with the Raiders. I mean, even Chucky would be smiling, and Chucky is actually John Gruden. <laughs> Uh, uh, Kaliki Hudson is a guy that, uh, uh, you know, where, where do you play, you know, him along with Tanner Muse, you know, both, both these guys seem, seem to be, uh, kind of guys that, that, that will enter the NFL without really a, a, a position, uh, talk about, and it seems like Steelers might have some interest in both Hudson and, and, and Muse. So if you would talk about both those guys where you see them drafted likes and dislikes. Fourth round on Muse. Oh, man, I tell you, Muse is my type of guy. I mean, you put him out there on the football field, he is simply going to kill people. He's the type of guy you look at New England losing that uh, Van Roy, losing Jamie Collins. He could step in and play a variety of roles. If you have Winovich and Muse out there as your outside linebackers over in New England, you're going to need a fire department on the sidelines because they're going to be playing with their hair on fire. And Hudson out of Michigan? I, I I like him, but I'm not crazy about him. I think his problem is a lack of instincts. Oh, he'll hit you, but he'll miss you at the same time, too. So it's the matter of, how could I put it, harnessing him a little bit and tell him, listen, I need you to think before you react, because usually when he reacts, that's when he gets in trouble. More of a sixth or seventh round guy, right? Uh, yeah, I would say day three, but you got to understand too, that you're looking at a situation right now. There's going to be a major run on tackles. There's going to be a major run on the edge rushes. There's going to be a monster run on the wide receivers. It's going to push the other guys at the other positions down quite a few rungs. And not that we think the Steelers are going to draft a cornerback in this year's draft. They could, but, uh, talk about the cornerback class and maybe some mid to late round guys, uh, uh, in, in, in that group. Look at round three, Troy Pride. I mean, go and look at that. Uh, if you want a, the best cornerback as far as production-wise goes the last two years, you're going to laugh at this. The Louisiana Tech kid, uh, Amir uh, Robinson. This is a kid that is in the top of every position breakdown category that you're looking for in a cornerback. Reminds me a lot of Mike Hilton, to be honest, is that, that feisty kind of slot corner. 
Um, I love guys that come up and could play the box, and that's yep. what those two guys could do. And you'll find them out there in round three still. I think the knock on uh, the Louisiana Tech kid is going to be his size, but mm -hmm. I always say size doesn't matter when you're back in the secondary. It's how you cover your man. I mean, last year they completed 19% of the passes in this area. My God. Wow. <laughs> Just to look broadly at this draft with all the unique challenges of this pre-draft disruption due to the coronavirus, how do teams handle character concerns and medical issues? Are they going to be more risk adverse and say, we're not, we're not going to take a chance on this guy just because we can't vet him the way we could in past years, just, just broadly for all positions? I think that teams are that are screaming that, hey, listen, I need a couple of extra rounds or we had a, a disability by not being able to see these kids are working them out. Those are teams that don't have Boy Scouts. The teams with the bigger scouting staffs have already done their homework. Let mm -hmm. me put it to you this way. There were 26 teams in the NFL that their scouting department's average salary and cost is $1.835 million. There were six teams out there that are consistently making the playoffs that their scouting staff has a budget of $3 million plus. Mm -hmm. And where do you see the Steelers? How do you view the Steelers scouting staff? I, I look at the continuity and how just they've had so much stability, the same guys for 10, 15, 20 years. How do you just view the Steelers staff overall in their process? Uh, they do a very good job over there. you you got to understand one thing. You have a hierarchy that's been in place, so it's a system that's set in place. How can I put it? I, I liken the Steelers' uh, scouting staff to the New York Yankees. You're always going to get consistency out of them. Mm -hmm. However, I do hope the general manager does make a call up to Coach Bill in New England for his offer. Bill's offering all three third-round draft picks right now and a fifth-rounder in order to move anywhere in round two. Now, you look at pick number 49. Pick number 49, if you go on a Jimmy Johnson value board, that's 410 points. If mm -hmm. you go ahead and trade for the three first, uh, third round draft picks in the fifth round from uh, uh, New England, that equals up to 384. But then I am sitting there. I got four third round draft picks, and that's where everybody is scrambling to get the guy before they wake up the next morning and see, oops, that guy's still on the board. I'd much rather have four third-round draft picks than one second-round draft pick. Mm -hmm. I'm with you. Yeah, you're not going to get an argument out of, you know, I, I think it's a perfect op opportunity potentially for the Steelers to trade down and, and acquire some picks in, uh, in you know, in the middle rounds. It'll be interesting to see if that comes to fruition. Uh, we don't think the Steelers are going to draft a quarterback this uh, this time around, but you've already commented. I want to hear your theory, you know, uh, uh, you, I want to hear your thoughts on Joe Burrow. For some reason, the Steelers fans have, have the hurts for Jalen Hurts. Uh, so talk about the uh, talk, talk about the quarterback class, Dave, and, and why you don't think Joe Burrow should be at the top of it. Day three, Pittsburgh steal a uniform, and they will say thank you very much. Kevin Davidson out of Princeton. Hmm. Okay, he was a kid that he was a kid that uh, helped out at uh, was all over the combine <laughs> doing drills, wasn't he? Well, that's what you want when you're an unknown, when you come into a school and then all of a sudden you end up starting for that school as a senior, people want to see a whole lot more of you. He did well in the bowl games. He did well over at the combines itself. And all of a sudden the people said, who is this kid? I right, talk about the top of the class and talk about Jalen Hurts. Uh, I like Hurts. I, I think uh, Jerry Jones is going to end up playing Bart Masterson with uh, Dak Prescott by using Hurts as the foil. I see Dallas taking him probably no later than the third round over here. And then if I'm Dak, I'm saying, you know what, Coach? I'm turning around and I'm signing the tender, but don't even dare putting a franchise tag on me the next year because it's going to cost you $40 million then. Me, I look at Dak Prescott. He's nothing more than a mechanic. Go back to 2018 when Travis Frederick had to sit out the year. That kid was getting pinged left and right. I thought he was a ping pong game. You turn around, they say, oh, well, we made the playoffs last year, but Dak hasn't gotten you to the promised land. It's time that you got to look at, you're bringing in a new coach, and what does McCartney like from his quarterbacks? He likes intelligence from his quarterbacks. I think that Dak looks at his primary targets too much, and that's what gets him in trouble. All right, why is Joe Burrow not your top quarterback, and who is? Uh, Joe Burrow's not my top quarterback because I liken him to Jim Plunkett. And I always, the irony of this all, 
Paul Brown, the founder of the Cincinnati Bengals, always practice what he preaches. Build an offensive line, then get me a quarterback. So now what's Cincinnati doing? With the worst offensive line in football, they're going ahead and drafting a franchise quarterback. Remember Jimmy, when Jimmy was drafted by New England and just got beat up, next thing you know, he's out there. He's in San Francisco. San Francisco tosses him out the door. He revived his career uh, uh, with the uh, Oakland Raiders. You turn around and look at Ryan Tannehill. He got his ass handed to him down there at Miami. They let him go. Patiently, he sat on the bench. That's why I'm looking at right now, and I don't understand a smart man like Tommy Telasco with the Chargers is not watching that workout tape with Tyrod Taylor and Cam Newton together. It was sort of like watching an NFL All-Pro going out there and playing with your Limbaugh football team quarterback. Alex, your turn. Well, who who is your top quarterback? If not, is it two zero? Is it Herbert Love? Who, who do you guys love? Top? I, I have oh. love for Love, and it wouldn't surprise me if Love does uh, an Aaron Rodgers type of uh, flop on draft day. Is there just I, concerns with his consistency in the poor senior year that he had with Love? Oh, I'm not concerned at all with him. Yeah. I think they're concerned with him. As far as right. I'm concerned, go back and look a couple of years ago when I was on the show with you guys, and I'm raving about Lamar Jackson, and he went at the tail end of the draft. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Deshaun Watson, he was my top quarterback down there. The day and age right now in the NFL is that you need a mobile quarterback. You need a guy that could go with the play action, the Russell Wilsons, uh, the uh, Kyla Murray types. Hell, I look at your quarterback right now. He might be a candidate to play right guard for you. <laughs> it's the big beard. It's the beard. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, it's the beard. Look at the gut. Oh, my God, man. When he was throwing balls out there, I, I was wondering where his softball beer league team was. <laughs> uh, Dave T., you've been doing this for so long, and, and, and you're just so clued into teams and what they're going to do. I remember last year you called the Chiefs and McCall Hardman. Like you said, they were going to trade up for him, and he was their guy, and they loved him, and, and they ended up doing it. Um, You've mentioned a lot of scenarios already, but is there one that kind of rises above the, the rest where you think this team is just going to take this player, the strongest link between – the player and the team? I think that this draft is going to be a buku draft for the Raiders and the Miami Dolphins. Do okay. not be surprised, like I said, if Simmons slides the number five, that all of a sudden the two hour, uh, the borough love, uh, the rumors out there of Miami trading up to number one and all this stuff. It's not going to be nothing more than a smoke screen. They're looking at a team that they want to build. And when you got all of that buku, what are they got, 14, 15 draft picks over there? You, you don't sit up there and take those draft picks and trade them away just for one guy. Mm-hmm. I look at it right now, and I'll be honest with you, I don't even think they would take two hours if he slides to number five. They have that many concerns about the injury factor with that kid. Wow. Now, if he was never injured over here, oh, geez, two hours will be the first guy off the board. Yeah, and, and with Oakland, you're thinking Winfield and Highsmith as their top guys? Uh, either that or they'll try to double up at wide receiver. They'll okay. probably end up walking away with Ruggs at number 12 and then popping in and taking Jefferson at number 19. Gotcha. Understand, Oak, uh, the, the Raiders are going to draft for need. They are not going to sit over here and say we're going to take the best available athlete. They want to mm-hmm. hit a home run. They want to come out of this draft over here with a team that's going to show the Las Vegas folks is, hey, thank you very much for letting me in your town. Now pay for an extra ticket or three because we're going to go into the playoffs. Dave, uh, talk a little bit about your thoughts on what the 2000, what's in store for the 2020 New England Patriots now. Uh, they're going to end up tanking. Uh, they're going to end up losing for a quarterback named T.L., and it won't be Tyler Lawrence. Hmm. Uh, in my history of grading people going back to 1968, John Elway and Bo Jackson were the only guys I ever gave a perfect grade. Right now up in North Dakota State, there's a kid named Trey Lance, and he has an 8.94 grade. That's the highest I've given a quarterback since Elway. Wow. Who was your top player in this class this year? Who's your highest grade? Oh, my top guy is Simmons. Right after okay. Simmons is Chase Young and then Okadu and then Werfs. Those are my top four. My fantastic four. After that is, hey, guys, sit over there and take what you need because the rest of the guys over here come with deficiencies. Where, where's Simmons' best fit? I know he can play everywhere, but where do you see him best fitting in the NFL? Who's that? I, Isaiah Simmons. Where does he best fit? 
Uh, he best fits on a team where a coach is going to go out there and say, I'm going to play you a little bit outside linebacker. I'll play you at middle. I'll mm-hmm. play you at safety. I'll play you up at the line. What you got to do, you have to create a position for Simmons. So when you go in college, it's similar to what he played down there. Dabo Sweeney called it the rover. That's right. how you got to play Simmons. And that's where the New York Giants blew it. They're coming up at number four. I mean, every logic says, I mean, even Ray Charles could see that Isaiah Simmons is the best player out there. Meanwhile, they're going to pass on him. Why? Because of the $37 million mistake of bringing two bums from Green Bay to their linebacker unit and Blake Martinez and Kyle Flackler. Dave, uh, not uh, uh, leaving the quarterback position out of this, who is the most overrated player in this year's draft class? Oh, uh, geez. There's a lot of them out there. I think Derek <laughs> Brown is going to be a big disappointment, and I could see why teams right now are looking at Javon Kinlaw more than they're looking at Derek Brown at the position. Uh, no knock on Barbara. Remember what I say. It's no knock on the kid itself. It's just that he's in a wrong, pres- uh, a, a wrong team to gain position, and look at the history of the Cincinnati Bungles. All right, uh, we're going to put you on the spot here uh, uh, at 49 overall for the Steelers. Uh, who, who, are they, who are they picking 49 overall? Oh, if Antoine Winfield's there, they got to jump on him. If not, I'm looking at Cesar Ruiz because of the offensive line issue, or if Ezra Cleveland slides down that far. I come up in round three. If I kept 102, Isaiah Wilson, what a manster over here, uh, there. He's sort of like a Trent Brown type. I could play him at either guard or tackle on the right side. Matt Hennessy is a guy that I really like for the simple reason is I'm looking at the age factor of Pouncey. I got to look at what's going on. At right guard, I could always play him there and then move him over to center when Pouncey leaves. If not in round three, if I see Akeem Robertson on the board, the Louisiana Tech cornerback, I'm jumping on him in a nanosecond. I come up in round four of the draft. Tanner Muse fits the Pittsburgh steel yep. mold. Let him go out there on the football field. However, I'm looking at a situation where if I didn't take Robbie on Roy in round three, I need a nose guard, and that guy is Lakey for two out of Utah, 6'5", 335 pounds. I mean, look at that trade that they did for Warmly over here. Warmly could not hold Hargrave's jockstrap, but we do have to look at the situation where Pittsburgh is. There's still $6 million over the cap. Who's going to be the casualty over there? I know that Fowler is tagged in with $12, 13000000 million, but could Nelson, the cornerback over there, be a casualty at $8.5 million? I tell you, you're not going to get uh, too much of an argument out of several names that you just listed because Alex and I have been. Well, I want to list one more wide receiver uh, who I think is an Andre Roberts kickoff return extraordinaire, and I could find him in, day, uh, in round six or seven. Folks, go look at some film of the Virginia kid, Joe Reed. Oh, my God. God, could this kid do everything on the football field? As a receiver, he reminds me a lot of Randall Cobb. As a return man, that's uh, Andre Roberts up uh, up at uh, Buffalo. Such a clone this kid is. All right, and tell everybody what you're doing right now. You, uh, you, you're you going to possibly be moving out my way out here uh, to Vegas. And uh, also, you'll tell them about your podcast once again and tell them where they can send send an email and get, get, uh, get an answer. Um, you know, I, I could promote the podcast, but I'd much rather promote the Q&A because I want to hear from your fans. I want to hear what's bothering them right now or a question that they might have. I mean, you turn on anything like ESPN or something, you're watching a 2002 football game. <laughs> Folks, at Scouts Honor Podcast at gmail.com. Any question you got, send it over. And if you say that you heard me on the Steelers podcast over here, when it comes time for the draft, I'll send you the scouting reports of every player that the Steelers take. But you got to let me know that you heard me on Steelers podcast. If not, you're going to go fishing. That sounds great. And uh, when you get out to Vegas now, you got to let me know because I'm going to go take you and buy you the best four ninety four ninety five steak and eggs. Uh- <laughs> You, you can find it. It's the least I can do for you after all these uh, 11 years worth of uh, uh, appearances on the podcast, though. Any well, other? My, well, well, my accent will probably be over in New York, New York, because if you give me a Nathan's hot dog, I'll love you for life. <laughs> there, you, there you go. Dave, as always, man, uh, we certainly do appreciate 
you know, having you on the podcast and all, and and uh, it's hard to believe it's been, I think, going on, uh, you know, I, th- this is the 11th year in a row. Uh, it just seems like yesterday I was blown away the first couple times having you on, just thinking, what in the heck have I gotten myself into here? And uh, you are, you know, without a doubt, every year at this time, people start clamoring, you got to get Dave T on, you got to get Dave T on, and uh, and that's what we do. So, uh, for, you know, uh, from Alex and myself, we appreciate having you on. On and and uh, as always, we look forward to doing this. Well, why don't you give your fans a little treat after the draft over here? Have me on so we could talk about all of their draft picks over here. I won't talk from the draft thing. You, I'll give you the scouting information on all of the guys that you took and where that square peg might fit in your round hole. That certainly sounds good. Let's let's uh, let's plan on doing that then, because Lord knows there won't be hardly anything else going on for for <laughs> sure to talk about. Uh, but Dave, once again, uh, be safe and uh, thanks again for coming on the Terrible Podcast with Dave and Alex. Thank you, Dave. Oh, having those Marmy Hills afraid I take over. And again, our thanks to Dave T. Thomas. Just tremendous information packed in about fifty-five minute interview. Just can can rattle off a player, and he's able to tell you everything about him. Again, that email is scout. Honor Scouts Honor Podcast at gmail.com. Be sure to listen to his podcast, Scouts Honor. I've listened to it before last year. Tremendous information, certainly more valuable this year uh, as a distraction to kind of pass the time. So, Dave, what are your uh, – it's a, it's a big question, I know, but what are your overall thoughts to what Dave T. had to say? Uh, just classic Dave T., right? Wow. Mm-hmm. You know, you, uh, like, like I said, you throw out one name, you get five back. Uh, uh you know, I, I'd like now to try to try my best to throw out questions without knowing which side of the fence I might be on with, with the player. That way, you know, to, just to make sure that he's he's not uh, going full contrarian, you know, which he mm-hmm. is, which he doesn't. You know, uh, I, I, you know, look, I mean, the, the guy can rattle off the stats and the pressures and and the late round guys like nobody's business. He's always had a unique ability uh, to do that, uh, obviously. And, and I think you would agree with me. We don't agree with everything that Dave T has to say, but it doesn't mm-hmm. mean that. Uh, look, I mean, we're just as wrong at at, por- at certain aspects of the draft as the next guy uh, is as well, too. And I think it's great to have a different perspective. And I think the op- my overarching thoughts, my overarching kind of takeaway uh, from from today's discussion with Dave Alex is the fact that uh, a lot of guys that he thinks you know uh, ha- have an opportunity to be Steelers, I think, are a lot of guys that we've kind of highlighted, and a lot of guys that we've had in our mock draft so far. Yeah, I was thrilled to hear him talk about Brandon Jones from Texas and Kayvon Wallace from Clemson, two guys that we've been really high on and, and really think could become Pittsburgh Steelers. Cesar Ruiz, that's the center from Michigan, um, I think has that classic Steelers kind of feel and mold to him. And yeah, I think if Winfield were to somehow fall to 49, and I don't anticipate it, I don't think Dave T does either, I think he's got Steeler written all over him. So yeah, I don't know if it makes it any easier for us, uh, but it, I think it is kind of confirmation makes it feel like we're doing a good job over here. Right. You know, he, he you know, right out of shoot, he talked about Roy out of uh, mm-hmm. out, yeah. out of, out of Baylor, guy. and that's a guy that I just had my last, uh, you know, late, uh, albeit late. You know what? Forgot to ask him about John Runyon. Damn it! Ah. Uh. Yep. Well, he, we we will talk to him after. So when the Steelers draft him, uh, we'll have Dave T back on the podcast. But you know, we talked about you know a, a few of the wide receiver, you know, a, a lot of the you know wide receivers that we think could be there uh, on the Steelers board, maybe second, third, fourth round. You know, Duvernay, you know, from, from really from kind of Jefferson on through Mims, and and it was interesting to get his thoughts on 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 Rager, right? You know. Yeah, well, I I, I, I kind of reacted early because he said, you know, Jalen Rager, you have the next Antonio Brown. I went, whoa, that's awesome. They said off the field. And I went, oh, no, I had, to, I, I had to you know change course there. So, yeah, I, I hadn't heard that with Rager, and that would certainly be a concern. Uh, yeah, what did you think about his thoughts on Josh Uche? Yeah, I knew I knew the second he said that about how you're going to get fired if you draft Josh Uche early, you were doing a little happy dance over there. I understand it. I, I mean, no, it's just more, it's more confirmation, you know, sure. uh, uh, of of you know like minded con- kind of confirmation. Look, I've mm-hmm. been I don't hate Josh Uche. I think I think people get the get get you know, get uh, that opinion. I just, I, I hate him at, at, at 49 overall. I'll tell yeah. you that, you know, well, I, I, I think from an athletic standpoint, there's a lot of things that the kid I think uh, uh, can do, can offer a team. I just am not one that thinks that it should happen at 49 overall. Mm-hmm. And I understand. And, and Dave T's concern is basically why didn't this guy play until last year uh, when they had to play him essentially. And even then uh, he was often a sub package third down pass rusher. And can he make that jump into a full time role in the NFL 
that's a really big projection. If he didn't do it in college, you know, what are the odds he can do it in the NFL? But I, I just go back to can, can he cover? Yes. Can he rush the passer? Yes. I think he's capable of that. There's no character concerns. He's a good athlete overall. Um, I, I, I do got to get on you. I thought that breakup on KJ Hamler, uh, I know it was underthrown, but the fact that that dude could basically run with KJ Hamler, who's the fastest player in this draft, I think speaks to that overall level of rare athleticism. That I, I, think you let your bi- I think you let your I bias, think you're like your bias, I think you let your bias get the best of you there, because if, I, if, if, the shoe, if the shoe was on the other foot, you say, you got to be kidding me, Dave. He's eight yards off the line of scrimmage at the snap of the football, and the ball hangs up, and uh, I mean, because if that ball's thrown out there, we're not even having this discussion, because he's beat by five yards there. And if it's any other linebacker, they aren't even coming close to KJ Hamlin. That dude runs like literally four twos and Uche's a step there. Yeah, I know that ball's underthrown, but Vince Williams is not making that play. I'll tell you that. All right. Well, he had two pass breakups last year. That was one he was credited with. The other one was, uh, 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 against middle Tennessee. I think, uh, first game of the first game of the season, he rushed free off the edge and batted down a pass, uh, uh, that way. So even if I gave you credit for, 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 for that pass breakup, which I'm not, against <laughs> Hamler, because I think you're just, a, I think you're a little bit too biased on that one. Even if I did, he had two for his entire, uh, uh, you know, 2019 season there, and 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 look, you and I are going to get de- this. Isn't the Dave and Alex breakdown of Josh Uche show <laughs> that that show will probably be next uh, uh, next Friday. We will we'll dedicate. We'll try to dedicate a lot more time to that. But I mean, can you give me and uh, without naming that play against Hamler or any one of the sacks that he had last season? Can you give me a signature play that that that, that Uche well, had last well, season? Well, I, I I reject the question because I don't know why we're taking <laughs> sacks off the board with a pass rusher. I mean, you tell me because you know, because like, I mean, look, you've seen them. A lot of them are inside sacks. I mean, you know, look, he. Had a great, he had a great uh, sack around the edge against, I think, Northwestern. Yeah. Uh, in that game where he showed the bend and and and, and showed the hand usage and all like that. But uh, let's face it, this guy, a lot of what he did last year in the sack department either either was a busted play, a free rush, or 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 or, or rush up the uh, uh, you know uh, inside the tackle. Okay. Uh, just you know, I think. All right, I'll I'll give you the I'll give you the Northwestern sack. All right, name name me another play other than that. You know, I mean, I'm just saying if you want to take sacks off the table for a pass rusher, it's like show me a receiver that you know, but take away his receptions and his touchdowns. I mean, you're is is, is, is is he an edge rusher? Is he an outside I, linebacker in the Steelers system? I've said he's a sub package edge rusher. You cannot play him on all, all three downs and expect to win. He's got to be off ball on early downs and a pass rusher on third down. If you make him an edge rusher on all three downs, you're right. He's not going to win, but you can he can play off ball, and I think he can play it well. You know, I, I tried to open up my mind a little bit on him too, and say, look, okay, well, go back to 2007, Mike Tomlin's first draft. You know, uh, Lawrence Timmons. You know, mm-hmm. uh, Lawrence Timmons came out of Florida State. What the heck is he? You know, yep. is, is he an edge? Is he? An he open, played a lot of edges, rookie. Uh, yeah, he played a lot. That's uh, all. Uh, you know, what is he? Okay, now obviously Lawrence Timmons became a great player in the National Football League. OK, mm-hmm. uh, 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 with the Steelers. But, you know, coming out of Florida State, that final year of his or last two years of his, uh, he had a lot of production. You know, he even yeah. look at his final year at Florida State at 70 something total tackles, had something like five sacks. I mean, uh, he was productive where you said, OK, well, we see we see the production here. And now we got to figure out where we could put him with Uche. You see a player, an athletic player that does a few, you know, few, you know, few things well, but you just don't have the volume of tape or the production where you say, okay, well, we've seen enough of that now, you know? Sure. You know, I, Uche had more sacks than Timmons. I think Uche had what, seven and a half sacks last year. Now I think Timmons mm-hmm. was playing more off ball at Florida state. So he's kind of was around the ball more, had a chance to get more tackles. I think it's harder to get a lot of tackles when you're a third down pass rusher like Uche is. So, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I hear that. Um, I mean, I, 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 I don't know. I, I don't know where I stand. All on right. That. Well, we'll have a little, we'll, you know, yeah. people, let's talk more about what Dave T had to say and not what we think. <laughs> and, Good point. and, and, and we'll talk more about Uche next Friday. Yeah. Now he has what Jordan Love, I think, was his top quarterback. Mm-hmm. I'm just kind of going in order here with Burrow. And, I, and his knock on Burrow wasn't the talent. It just, he feels like, I guess, the situation in Cincinnati is not going to be conducive to success. Well, I, I, you know, I don't see how you look. I, I understand. Look, you either, you know, my, 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 I'm old school philosophy. You either get mm-hmm. yourself a quarterback, you get you a guy that can protect the quarterback, or you get you a guy that can get after the quarterback. All right, know? all right. Uh, and, and, you know, I think it's obviously obvious. I mean, look, the, the Bengals are not going to be able to compete uh, at all uh, in the AFC North alone if they don't find 
find a quarterback. It's just not mm-hmm. going to happen. So, uh, uh, you know, and, and to me, it's hard not to. I, I saw enough Burrow uh, down the stretch there that I thought, man, this, you know, this, this kid really, you know, he can, he can make plays outside. Of, he can really improvise. He can do a lot of things that you would think that you would need a starting quarterback in the NFL to do to succeed. Mm-hmm. So it makes me hard. You know, as far as what's behind Burrow, I, I really haven't done enough research on that because, I mean, obviously we don't think the Steelers are going to draft the quarterback. But I, I've done enough where I think that Joe Burrow personally is the top quarterback in this draft. Yeah, I'm with you. But I think the concern is real with the Bengals, that offensive line. Um, is Bergen going to succeed behind there? Because he played behind a great offensive line this last year in LSU where four of the five guys are going to the draft. And I know the Bengals are going to get back Jonah Williams. But, yeah, that, that old line's a concern. With running back, he's got Taylor as his top guy. He's a little down on DeAndre Swift. I know we'll save that discussion for, for Tuesday's show. But I'm kind of with Dave T. I, didn't, I wasn't as impressed with Swift. And so many people have him as a top back. And I, I just didn't see it. You know, he didn't really talk much about Dobbins either, did he? No, we should ask. That's my bad. I should have asked. Yeah, we should have. We should have asked a little bit more about it. He uh, he obviously likes uh, uh, Edwards Hilaire, but but mm-hmm. that, it doesn't sound. And he likes Acres too. I don't think he. I, he pro, to me, I I, I take it he he kind of views both those guys as maybe third round guys, right? Yeah, yeah, I think he said Akers in the third round. I think Akers could be really in contention for Pittsburgh if they want to go running back. I think Eddie Faulkner recruited him when he was at NC State. Obviously, Akers ended up going to Florida State, but really fits the mold in a lot of ways for what they look for. I mean, we still stand by. I mean, uh, uh, if they if they're gonna if the Steelers gonna draft one, they're probably gonna draft one at forty nine, right? You think? Early day two. I mean, maybe at one or two if someone were to slip, uh, because it is a pretty you know running back heavy class, and the other positions go early. But but yeah, I, I think day two are bust. Okay. All right. Uh, interesting thoughts on him from from. What do you think about the? Uh, have you watched any of the Memphis kid that the, who was it Taylor? Yeah, uh, I, I watched Patrick Taylor. I didn't like him that much. I just didn't see anything. Maybe I was watching the wrong tape because he did come. You know, he battled that injury his senior year. Um, just I kind of saw a linear dude that isn't super explosive. But I lo- I love Antonio Gibson from Memphis. I think that's the Memphis guy you want to take. Uh, and didn't ask his thoughts on Kelly out of UCLA. We probably should have, uh, any other running backs that we, that, 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 uh, that, uh, you'll be interested to find out where this Memphis kid in, in, ends up being drafted at. Which Taylor or Gibson? Taylor. Or both. Yeah. Taylor. I had him as a late day three, a borderline draftable guy, but he's a big dude. And, uh, those Memphis guys have had success receivers. Uh, what are your thoughts on what Dave T said about the receivers? I think it's kind of in line of what we think overall would position group. Uh, I was surprised to, 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 uh, of course we don't know, we don't talk to the kid and, and probably need to, uh, uh, read, you know, see, research it a little bit more, but, uh, talking about, you know, Jalen Rieger, you know, being the next Antonio Brown, I, I got both of us probably excited at first, but then he said, uh, Same. when it comes off. to, when it comes to off the field. So, uh, that, that, that caught me by surprise. Yeah, and he likes Claypool. He's an interesting guy. Just get him on the field, and you'll find a way to make him fit. Uh, who else did he talk about? Jawan Jennings is someone I still think can succeed in the NFL, but he mentioned his teammate, Walt Calloway, and potentially being on the Steelers' radar. So that's something I need to research a little bit more. Uh, he seems to be okay on Mims and, and, and Pittman. Pittman's another one of those guys that I'm just I'm, – I'm not getting it, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it, the biggest issue for you is just that lack of a, a trait that rises above the rest? Yeah. Okay. I mean, look. I mean, he, uh, uh, you know, with 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 him, I, I just think there's a there's there's a level of rawness uh, in him that that needs to be taken care of. That that's going to keep him because look, you you play predominantly on the left side, right? You know, uh, uh, at, at USC with Pittman and just so many. I definitely think it's going to be a hard red shirt freshman year for him in the NFL. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Um, and for a senior too, is it, surprising. With the tight end class, he's clearly not a fan of it. He really, I think he said, really wouldn't take anybody on 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 day one or day two. He liked the Gora, the the H back from Cincinnati. He has Komet as his top uh, tight end begrudgingly. And uh, he mentioned that was it Eastern Michigan kid. I need I, I hadn't really heard of him. Uh, kind of undersized, but but somebody that I definitely would do a, a deeper dive into. Yeah, I haven't. Uh, what, what what do you know? What do you know of, of, about him? 
Nothing really. So I mean, that name is kind of off the radar. Um, one of those Mac kids, though. Uh, if it's EMU, I'm trying to find his name. I can't find him on the, on the, the website I'm looking at. But we'll look uh, him up. And yeah, I mean, obviously the tight end class isn't great, and I think that's one reason why this team wanted to go out and and, and get Eric Ebron to try to protect themselves. And again, in a year where, as Dave T mentioned, as we've talked about, you know, rookie offseason programs are going to be essentially wiped out. It's going to be so hard for these guys, any position, but I think especially tight end, to get on a moving train and be ready for the start of the regular season, whenever that might be. So uh, better to get a veteran, I suppose, and try to count on a rookie to produce in year one. Yeah, I I, I would agree with that for sure. What would you think about the the late round kid out of Indiana? Yeah, he loves those. Something about Indiana, because he was talking about Wes Martin last year, who went higher than, I mean, Dave T hit this uh, on on the head, you know, because no one knew who Wes Martin was. He was undrafted projection, and then went in the fourth round to Washington. And so, what's his name? Stepniak? Yes. uh, And I I, I actually knew a little bit about him going through some of his tape. And, you know, he's a right guard play. He was a, you know, he was a captain. Uh, there for them, mostly I think predominantly played right guard for them at at at, at Indiana. He he done, he didn't jump off the tape for me, you know. Okay. Uh, do, you I, remember, do you remember Wes Martin last year? Do you remember his game? Do you have any kind of, sort of comparison? No, I don't. I don't okay. remember him. Uh, yeah. uh, I don't remember that tape from last year. Yeah. But I trust Dave T when it comes to Indiana, who's your guards, because he nailed it with Wes Martin last year. Probably do the same this year. Um, I, I love that he likes Ezra Cleveland, and if he wore to slip of 49, I mean, I, I warmed up to the idea of taking a tackle over these last couple weeks, even over interior offensive linemen. And I know that, obviously, in year one, this dude's not going to play, and he might not exactly be day one ready either. But that, that long-term talent and upside, if he gets a little bit stronger, talking about Ezra Cleveland, is going to be difficult to pass up at 49 if he falls that far. Look, I, you're not, you, know, I, you won't have to twist my arm overall. I mean, I, I've warmed up to it too, uh, you know, uh, drafting a tackle at some point. Uh, look, they, they, Kevin Colbert has set himself up to, to, to go a lot of different ways with this, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, with, with offensive linemen. And, and, you know, could, could it be more of a true tackle? Yeah, I, I suppose it could be. I mean, obviously, um, uh, you, you want to say, look, we, we think maybe interior offensive line uh, uh, may be versatile to play both guard uh, and center would, would be the way to go. But I, you know, once again, I don't think I'll be shocked if they if they go, you know, full full blown tackle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially if, you, if the right talent has to be there. I think Cleveland will be a talent that would justify it. I was surprised he was so low on Cushenberry. I should have asked more about why he didn't like Cushenberry, but he likes Damian Lewis from LSU. Uh, like I said, LSU's got four guys in this draft with Sadiq Charles, the left tackle, has got some off-the-field concerns. Adrian McGee, another guy with some off-the-field concerns. But I really like Cushenberry and Lewis. I just love their competitiveness. These guys went through the whole season, senior bowl, combine, competed every step of the way. I think that's really impressive. And and quite honestly, to be uh, when, when it comes to Cushenberry, Barry, he might be the more versatile between him and, and Ruiz. I know Ruiz did play a little bit of guard, but mm-hmm. uh, I think uh, uh, Cushenberry, if you go back to especially when you when you uh, I think it was it was a freshman or, or sophomore year when he kind of broke into that lineup, he did so at left guard uh, yeah. uh, uh, originally. Now it didn't take long for him to get moved over over to center, but I think uh, when it comes to position. Uh, flexibility uh, or at least experience at the guard position. I think Cushenberry has that over Ruiz. I think both those guys, and really I think the, the, the temple center as well too. Mm -hmm. I love Tennessee. You know, uh, I, I, I think, I think all three of those guys could potentially be in play for the Steelers. The interesting thing is, is, and I've seen mock drafts now with, with Ruiz, I think at like first round, like 14 mm-hmm. or 15 overall. And then of course I've seen him down, you know, uh, 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 in, in, into the, you know, tail end of the second round, you know? So it's going to be, I mean, is he the top center? And then look, I mean, Tyler uh, Biedish uh, out of Wisconsin, I've now seen him. People think that maybe he's around, you know, third or fourth round mm-hmm. uh, c- category. Yeah. So really kind of hard to judge, you know, uh, uh, the center position here. Yeah, uh, I think you'll be leaning on Gil Brandt's release uh, and kind of get a better gauge because Ruiz is kind of all over the map. Uh, really is. And look, uh, for, for for those that didn't understand that reference, uh, uh, Gil Brandt every year puts out a, a, what he calls a hot 150. And I think pound for pound when it comes to list and, 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 and looking at top 150 uh, uh, prospects in a draft and as far as where they end up being drafted overall – 
I don't think anybody does it better than Gil Brandt, to be honest with you. And mm-hmm. uh, I tweeted at him that th- th- this past week, and he said that'll be out on Monday. Oh, so nice. uh, I will be all over that on Monday. So look for NFL.com and Gil Brandt's uh, what, what he calls a hot 150, because I think that'll give us maybe, you know, who, who knows really, but I think that'll give us maybe a better idea of, you know, is, is Ruiz more you know, first round or, or late second round and yeah. where, where a guy like, like Tyler out of Wisconsin is final thoughts with the, the hog mollies up front with Ruiz. Yeah. I, I think it's similar to Cushenberry because Ruiz played guard his first year. I think his redshirt freshman year, it would have been at Michigan and then he kicked up uh, the center. But, but I think Dave T said he liked the more guard than center. So it's kind of a BJ Finney vibe. I see him though as a, a center that could, could play that pivot for a long time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, most definitely. With the defensive line, uh, yeah, I mean, right off the top, you mentioned the guy that you just had in your mock draft with is it Bravion, Bravion Roy from Baylor. It's mm-hmm. kind of that classic, you know, plugger that higher than what you had, and that surprised me as why well. I hadn't heard Roy in the third round, but a fit for Pittsburgh nonetheless. I'm surprised he has him. What did he say? Third round? Second? He said I think late two or date, you know, or third round. Man, that 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 surprised me on that because mm-hmm. because he is, I mean. You know, he, he's he's a zero and a one, you know, right, right. Uh, as far as technique goes. And, and even though, yeah, he played a lot of snaps at at, 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 at Baylor there, I I just think he's more of a specialized dude. And, mm-hmm. and because of that, I mean, I had him in my mock. Where did I have him? Six round? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think anywhere between fourth and six I could probably see. But uh, interesting that Dave has him ranked that high. Yeah, and then he liked Gallimore. You know, one guy I watched, and I've, I've really gotten to watch a lot closer over the last couple of days from Texas A&M, Justin Matibuque, and I like him more than Gallimore, and he's kind of in that similar mold of a, of a Hargrave type, more athletic pass rusher as opposed to a plugger like Roy, but man, Matibuque is a great kid, a really good athlete. I think he's more flexible, has more bend than Gallimore, probably has more, he does have more production as well. The issue with Gallimore and Ross Blacklock, for example, are lack of production. So if he's there at 49, Matibuque, I'd be really tempted to take him. Uh, I just think overall, I mean, look, I mean, the safeties, a couple of safeties that you and I have circled throughout this thing, Brandon Jones, and of course, uh, Antoine Winfield Jr. Uh, I think we're kind of, uh, in, in step with them when, when it mm-hmm. comes to that, I, I think we're in step with them when it comes to guys like Muse and, 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 and Kaliki Hudson. And really for that matter, you know, uh, uh, who, who was the other, uh, uh versatile player that we talked about or, or no, maybe it was just Muse and Hudson that we talked about. I mean, we mentioned Duggar uh, and Simmons. I mean, it was Isaiah Simmons we, we, mm. ta- Isaiah, we talked about. Yeah, I think Muse really fits Pittsburgh, and I'm really thinking he's going to be with one of their fourth-round picks. Tanner Muse is going to be their guy. I, I really think so, too. I, I think that's easy to kind of pencil in, especially if, if he's – now, the question is, do you take him with the first of four, first of two or, or, or try to wait and get him with the second of the uh, yeah, uh, it's you like know, nine pick two. difference. Uh, so, you know, that, that, that might be the thing there, and – uh, what else surprised you about what he had to say about maybe the individual player? Uh, well, I, I agree wholeheartedly that Ashton Davis is, is a is a round two, not a day two, but a round two guy. I mean, four two eight. I mean, I don't. I guess that was at a junior pro day because he has not been able to work out, to my knowledge, in this pre draft process. Um, he's talking about some of the edge guys: Daryl Taylor, Curtis Weaver. Um, yeah, I can see the Steelers having interest in both of those guys. Uh, okay. Uh, what else? Uh, with the inside linebackers, what he liked, Queen, uh, is kind of his top. I mean, I guess behind Simmons. Um, yeah, he, he's right to point out the, the size concerns with, with Davis Gaither. But, you know, in this new age NFL, um, and, and even these inside linebackers, like Vince Williams, everyone thinks Vince Williams is a big guy. He's like 235 pounds. So Davis Gaither isn't too far off from that. And I think just a really athletic guy with great instincts and had a great senior bowl week. What did you think about his thoughts on Zach Bond? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I think he's a guy that can wear a lot of hats, play edge, play off ball. Um, we know those Wisconsin guys. I mean, he kind of feels like a stealer. He's not going to make it to, to 49 for Pittsburgh. I think Dallas is, might be looking pretty hard at him at 17. Um, but Ooh, but yeah. Uh, think, Bond, you think Bond, yep. Bond goes that early, huh? Uh, that's what I've heard from some of the Cowboys guys I listen to. I mean, I don't know for sure. But I, I think Bond has a good chance to be a first-round pick somewhere in the first round. I, I'll be surprised if he's first round. I'll go on record and say I'll be surprised. If you think he gets round. to 49? I think he could, yeah, I okay. do. Okay, yeah, I haven't watched him super in depth because I just didn't really feel like he was gonna be in play. He only he missed our uh, what they look for study by two pounds in the weight category, so he checks a lot of boxes. All right, uh, we didn't ask him about Evan Weaver, Dad Gummit. We should have. Uh, yeah. We should have asked him about uh, about his thoughts on Evan. You know, you the deeper you get into Evan Weaver's tape, you can see him make some plays sideline to sideline. 
Really? Okay. I mean, a little so, bit. I mean, on screens yeah. and stuff like that, you know, stuff that, that uh, his instincts help him, you know, uh, read, react, you know, is good on, on certain of them. It's not littered with it. You know, his tape's not mm-hmm. littered with it, obviously, because he's just he's just not an athletic freak. But, uh, but that guy, if you're going to wait on it, if you were to wait, you know, uh, he would be a guy to get in the later round, six or seventh mm-hmm. round. What did you make of just of his overall thoughts on how this draft draft process is changing and evolving this year and the reliance on scouts? I think that was great insight, him talking about how teams are going to rely on their scouts a whole lot more because these position coaches, these coordinators just haven't seen these guys up close and personal. Well, yeah, especially when you when you talk about a team like like the Steelers that like to go and put their hands on them, you know, mm-hmm. uh, when, when, when you talk about uh, – I mean, look – this, what the scouting department probably does year in and year out didn't change. Talking about sure. uh, from 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 the end of last year's draft to the end of college football season, they do their mm-hmm. they they you know they have the binder full of info uh, for you on there. I think it's just the little things, the hearts and smarts and the character, and uh, uh, we want to talk to his parents and especially where the Steelers are, are concerned because obviously Kevin Colbert and Mike Tomlin like to go go to these these key pro days uh they like these power five kids they like them you know and especially when you go back to even the combine this year alex with with you know you only had the 45 uh uh mm-hmm. uh you know, uh, sit downs instead of the 60. Okay. Uh, I imagine they spent a lot more time with the, with the younger, with the underclassmen this time around, uh, as opposed, right. as opposed to some of the older guys, you know, luckily they had the senior bowl. They probably talked they, that, that part of it, the, the senior bowl and the East West shrine game and all, none of that probably changed, but, sure. uh, uh, I, I guess what I'm getting at is where the Steelers are concerned. I, I view them as being highly, their process being highly interrupted from the combine on. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't think the scouts job change. I think their influence change where they're going to be a lot more influential because they've seen these guys up close and personal, like I said, and, and these, you know, coaches and coordinators haven't. And Dave T made the great point that he said there were six teams that didn't send some of their coaches and coordinators to the combine. I think the Rams were one of them. And I don't know who the other, other ones were. I think Pittsburgh did send their guys. And so a team like the Rams really missed out because they didn't have their guys at the combine either. And, and obviously pro days got wiped out and they're really going to pay the price for that. I, I think it's going to cause certain teams and the Steelers to be one of them to really play it, uh, uh, mm-hmm. uh, be risk adverse, you know? Yep. That's the uh, word, risk adverse. Uh, just, uh, you know, look, we know that we know what we're getting here as opposed to, well, we think that we like this, but mm-hmm. we're not, you know, we have a couple of questions. And look, and with only six picks in a draft, and not, at least, at least th- it's a heck of a year not to have a first round draft pick and have your first round draft pick technically be playing in his second season for you. Right, right. What did you make of his comments about trying to trade back, even with the enemy and the Patriots? I think trading back, though, makes a lot of sense. I don't think they're going to get that kind of package that he talked about. Yeah, what did he say, like three-thirds? Three, I three, mean, thir- three thirds three. and like a fifth or something like that. I mean, heck, yeah. if you get it, great. But, uh, I mean, look, we've talked for a little while now that if something was to happen that wouldn't hurt her feelings, it would be to move, move down uh, in the second round, you know, however many spots and pick up what you can, maybe third or fourth round and, and, and go from there. So I think we're kind of, I think we're kind of in agreement with them there. 49 though could kind of be prime trade up for that quarterback, that second tier guy that's fallen. I mean, you know, Drew Locke, I think what the Broncos traded up for him at 42 last year. So Pittsburgh might be in that range where some team might come calling and trying to get that last quarterback off the board before uh, there's a real fall off. So yeah, I, I think that's a great opportunity to maybe not New England, but maybe, but uh, to move down with somebody. Yeah, I, I think it's definitely a possibility for sure. And uh, uh, once again, uh, you know, in, in some of these middle rounds, and Dave T hit on this, is the fact that there's, there's going to be a lot of good players, I think, uh, in in the third round there, and guys that would fit the Steelers that that you know you can never have too many too many of those kind of guys. Now, I, you know, obviously, and I think he hit on this. It's going to be hard to get a, you know, uh, uh, most of these rookies on the field mm-hmm. uh, spe- uh, and, and, and contributing heavily, especially with the Steelers, uh, because of you know uh, what's likely to get wiped out this offseason. Right, right. One guy I did mention was Alex Highsmith, the edge from Charlotte. Uh, this team, I think, had some interest in, was trying to bring him in for a visit. I think they had to do a FaceTime kind of deal. And anytime they start looking at these smaller school players, I perk up a little bit. And he seems to say that Highsmith might be uh, even a third round kind of guy. So could that be someone at 102? We know they're going to likely take an edge, maybe higher than some people think. Highsmith at 102, I wouldn't dismiss it. 
Yeah, but then again, you get into the non-Power 5, and how much do you really know about this guy? Yeah, you know? well, I think that, that speaks to they wanted to talk to him. And anytime they want to talk to these small school guys, say that they have more interest there than than usual. And you know, I, I pay attention to that a little bit more. All right, uh, anything else Dave T. had to say? Uh, interesting thoughts on, on Willie Gay, not overly surprising. Mm-hmm. Uh, his tape, you know, his tape flashes, but, you know, can 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 you deal with that guy in the locker room? You know, is that a guy you want in your locker mm-hmm. room? Yeah, it's just a lot harder to vet these guys this year. That's going to be the issue for medical and character concern guys. Um, I think that was about it. Yeah, it was just a really good discussion. And uh, as Dave T said, uh, hopefully he'll come on after the draft and we can evaluate what the Steelers actually end up doing. And very gracious of him to offer his email uh, for fans to uh, send them a question. And again, if if you ask him a question, uh, be sure to mention you heard him on the Terrible Podcast, heard him on Steelers Depot, and uh, he'll send you that draft guide on draft day. Yeah, absolutely. Make sure and, and, and look, I mean, uh, uh, we love having him on, but we, it's no wonder why people clamor for us to have him on. And we'll try to have him on after the draft, uh, uh, you know, as he offered and as Alex just said mm-hmm. there. All right. Uh, with that, shall we move on to a few uh, reader emails here? Yeah, let's do it. All right, this one's from Evan, and it's titled Todd Haley. Uh, Dear Dave and Alex, quarantine must be getting to my head. Rewatching the old Steelers games makes me miss that old wacky Steelers offense. Can you go through and tell me what you liked, disliked about Todd Haley's offense and explain what what you think got him fired? Also, do you think uh, Feetner is better? Thanks for all you guys do. Keep the podcast coming. Side note, when you guys do draft profiles on the podcast, can you repeat the prospect's name more as as you name traits if 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 i miss the name i can hear you guys talk about his traits but have no idea which prospect you're talking about please okay we'll try to we ain't got many more days uh, to do that but we'll try to make a concerted effort to do that uh todd haley's offense uh what you'd like disliked um yeah his overall game plans i mean obviously from a a coordinator standpoint from a game plan standpoint um it it was strong everything else was kind of the issue with haley the attitude the relationships with ben and the coaching staff overall and and just kind of that prickly disposition i guess was kind of the issue with haley i think quarantine's getting to haley too because i think i saw on twitter he's trying to get verified he was like tweeting at jack or something to get the blue check mark so yeah i think i think haley's whole thing was well documented that as a coordinator he was talented uh but everything everything past sundays was the problem with todd haley uh todd Haley's a lot like me he's easy to not not to like <laughs> <laughs> and obviously the relation i you know i, I, I as, as time wore on you know uh, 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 you know, things got prickly, as expected between him and Ben. Uh, I, I imagine uh, uh, Todd kind of likes to get the last word on certain things mm-hmm. and all. Uh, I, I thought they could win with his offense, you know, and, and did. I thought he did some good things with Ben and concentrating on getting the football out of his hands, you know, mm-hmm. uh, over the years there. Now, the question, do we, do, do we think Randy's better? I, th- I think it's still early to tell, and really, quite honestly, I know people ain't going to like to hear this. I think last year just needs to be thrown out. I think to an extent, but there's still valid criticism of, of Feetner. You know, but uh, is he better? He hasn't done it. No, I mean, the answer, is he better than Todd Haley? Not yet, no. Yeah. Uh, because he, he he just he hasn't he really hasn't done anything yet. So this, this year will be massive though for him. This year <laughs> really will be bad, and that's what I keep putting. You know, look, uh, it's easy to look back at last year and say, oh, why isn't he throwing at the tight end? Uh, throwing to the tight end. Why why didn't he do this? Do that? Look, uh, he can call the plays. You know, he he doesn't he you know he doesn't pull the trigger on a lot of these. So and obviously with the quarterback situation and the injuries and James Conner and and just so many moving parts last year. Personally, I think. Just just last year needs to be, you know, wiped out completely. But make no mistake about it, this year is a big year for Randy Feetner. Uh, it's obviously a big year for, for for Ben Roethlisberger, and I don't think it's a mistake that that Matt Canada was was brought mm-hmm. in to kind of maybe help give another perspective of this thing. Yeah, I agree. Although there were injuries, but injuries don't uh, don't mean you have to have Jalen Samuels throw a five yard out to James Washington. Right, right. <laughs> there was absolutely there were, things like that will drive you mad. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, 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 and, and and look the the whole wildcat in the game against what uh, the uh, the Buffalo you know uh, mm-hmm. uh, with with uh, Deontay Johnson I mean little things like that look it, look you could go through every game and you can criticize five to seven play calls easily all right because you uh, from, from from a results bias uh, standpoint easily uh, but uh, 
you know, there were about four or five plays in general from last season that really got you scratching your head. Look, I'm not a fan of running on second and, you know, seven, eight, you know, or more uh, on top of it. He did quite a bit of that last year. I understand why, probably because of the quarterback situation and, and injuries and all. But, uh, yeah, look, he's got – long and short, he's got a lot to prove this year. Yep, I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, Lucas writes in – uh, hey, Dave and Alex, uh, my name is Lucas and I'm a long time listener from Toronto, Ontario in Canada. Good to have you on a eh, Lucas. Uh, uh, <laughs> don't do that for Lucas. He's, 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 he's clicked out. Look, we got a Canuck that works for us in, in, in Daniel, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, yeah. uh, I'm just having some fun with Lucas. Last year we saw Minka's production slow down a bit towards the end of the year, simply due to teams not throwing anywhere near him. What are some ways the Steelers can scheme their defense to prevent teams from almost taking him out of the passing game? We know he will always be a sound tackler, as you pointed out the other day. Keep up the great work. Uh, you guys are the best in business. I've personally learned a lot from you too. Well, that's very kind of you. Thank you for that, Lucas. Uh, look, I think it's a lot of things. You go back to some some of the things that uh, Mika said right after this kind of you know during the Pro Bowl week there, and he's kind of reiterated. I think a time or two in some other uh, interviews, he's got to be more open to moving around some. Now he wasn't, a, he wasn't a big, evidently wasn't a big fan of, 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 playing close to the line of scrimmage as much as let's say Miami had him doing uh, mm-hmm. there. But I, I think you're going to have to be a little bit more versatile with your post safety period. And if you do that, you look, make a, uh, uh, do a couple, you know, uh, rotations late and, 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 and kind of confuse the quarterback and, and, and not, not be so black and white as, as where the post safety might be uh, on, on, on certain situations. It'll provide more opportunities for Minka. It really comes down to what kind of confidence do you have in Terrell Edmonds to play that deep middle or maybe that deep half occasionally a little bit more often. Um, if he can show those those strides, because obviously like th- there's two there's two issues. You know, If you move Minka, that's one thing, but then who else is going to move to replace Minka is the other part of the equation, and the other guys have to be able to move as well. And so that's going to be uh, the issue. But yeah, I mean, really just is about getting Minka out of that post spot, being able to play more versatile, uh, closer to the line of scrimmage, over slot, maybe blitzing a little bit more um, and just having a more, you know, varied plan, I guess, with him. I mean, and I think that'll come in year two with, you know, the whole off season and some sort of training camp and preseason to kind of tinker and figure this stuff out. And everyone's comfortable playing with each other's, but no turnover in the secondary for the first time in a long time. So that'll be really important heading into year two for Minka. Yeah, look, I mean, uh, uh, uh... We make it sound so easy. Well, we just trade for the guy, and and you know, a couple of weeks into the season, and and the whole playbook's open to you. Well, you you yeah. wanted to kind of ease him in. You wanted to, and that's what they did with him. Yep. You know, yep. they wanted to make his transition as easy as possible, and. You know, we we heard we've we've heard guys in the past like Vance McDonald and some of these guys that have missed OTA time and these guys that have arrived kind of late, if you will, talking about boy, it sure it sure was not you know it sure would be nice to have that that OTA time or that mm-hmm. or that 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 extra training camp time uh, there. And I think we saw that last year with Minka. Yeah, he was absolutely fan. The fact that he made the Pro Bowl and, and was first team All Pro uh, coming over, you know, like that is just phenomenal. And it speaks of his ability. Now you can maybe even go up on another level with him if right. you're able to move him around a little bit more. And, and I want to double back to the point I just mentioned is that when was the last time the Steelers starting secondary, including nickel corner in that, was completely the same from last year to the next. I, I don't know when it's been. It's been a long time. Yeah, that's a great point. I guess it would have been some somewhere along like the lines of Ike Taylor and Gay Clark, and, I, yeah. and and Clark and Paul Amala, right? You know? Right, because obviously, you know, last year, Steven Nelson, Minka get added uh, throughout the course of the offseason and, and regular season. The year before, Edmonds, I mean, and they obviously a couple of years ago just totally revamped that entire secondary with, you know, cutting a lot of dead weight and trying to bring in a lot of new faces. So the fact that you have the same core group of guys really almost aside from already completely unchained secondary I mean, you'll add a safety at some point obviously but overall the, the core is the same is the first time in maybe a decade and that's going to provide a lot of value all right uh let's see if we can find another email we didn't i, I think uh let's see 
from Wes. Hey guys, I wanted to check in and make sure you are both staying healthy during this terrible time our country and the rest of the world is going through. Dave, I'm glad you really made me laugh when you mentioned Fantasy Island, when you said, <laughs> boss, the plane, the plane, and Alex had no idea what you were talking about. When it comes to Alex's current living situation, all I could think of was what we all often hear on Alex's end. Boss, the train, the train. I, <laughs> I missed it. I missed that. I, 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 I probably wasn't even funny when I did it, but it probably could have been a little bit more funny had I gone with the train, the train, instead of the plane, the plane. Uh, nice. Much funnier when you picture Hervé uh, Villachez. Hey, you gotta watch. You gotta. Even, have you watched that doc? That uh, that movie on Hervé Villachez, Alex? <laughs> no. I found uh, out who who's that tattoo guy. He's yeah, very short. I found yeah. out who he is. I'm mad. You, you told me I was him. <laughs> <laughs> now I know uh, you know, you know who uh, Peter Dink, Dink, Dinklage yeah, is, right? Yeah, I, I know Peter Dinklage. Uh, well, there's a movie, I think, uh, The Tragic, Beautiful, True, uh, uh, or where is it? Uh, My Dinner with Hervé uh, is the name of the movie. And it's uh, uh, Peter Dinklage uh, uh, playing the role of Hervé uh, Village. Quite an interesting movie. It really is. Uh, so and who I, is Hervé? It, it's one of these char- these actors? Yeah, Hervé Village is, is the guy that played Tattoo, okay. uh, the, the, the little person. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he was he he got a start I think in some James in a James Bond movie. My my wife could tell you that my wife's a huge James Bond fan, uh, so she could tell you. Uh, but you know, unfortunately, you know, uh, ran into alcohol problems and all like that. But anyway, this this time it really is a great time to to watch that doc that that movie uh, on Hervé Village uh, Villages. Uh, but anyway, mm-hmm. he says uh, much funnier when you picture Hervé saying it. I'm not making fun of Alex at all. I consider him a friend. It was just funny how you said. And it made me think uh, of those loud trains. I uh, hope both of you are well <laughs> and, and have a great day. Thanks for the email, Wes. Uh, Thank you, Wes. No, uh, no, no offense taken. All in good fun. You got you, You've been going outside at all day. You staying indoors, right? You got a mask. <laughs> I'm just not going out. I'm just yeah. not going out right now, man. I had to go to, I had to go to the store like several days in a row dur- during that early stages up because nobody had meat and. You know things like that, but since right. then uh, we got that taken care of, and and uh, I, I had the wife uh, wifey do the the uh, the chore yesterday. Uh, obviously Sunday is Easter, right? Today's Good Friday, so I forgot to mm-hmm. wish everybody a Good Friday. What what a day! You know, good Friday, we have Dave T on mm-hmm. on on Good Friday. So uh, anyway, I sent wifey out uh, uh, honey baked ham, so we loaded up on. Uh, it's almost we're like having Thanksgiving uh, 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 this weekend on Easter there, so we got all the fixings and. Ham and turkey and pies and ice cream and 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 all that stuff that we're doing. What about you? You're staying indoors, right? You're probably on those damn video games. Mm-hmm. I'm playing with my Pittsburgh Pirates franchise and out of the park, and uh, we're not doing too well. Uh, yeah, I'm staying indoors. Uh, I have my mask, so whenever I do, probably go to the store tomorrow. But yeah, hopefully everyone staying indoors, staying safe, staying healthy. All right, I think we've got. Uh, I think we've got all the emails knocked out there. So once again, uh, look, hope you enjoyed this episode. Uh, uh, reach out, make sure if you got a question, to give give that email address to Dave T again, Alex. It is Scouts Honor Podcast at gmail.com. That's how you can contact Dave T with your draft questions and tell him you heard him on the Timber Podcast on Steve Lewis Depot. Absolutely. Uh, Alex, great show. Uh, look forward to doing this show uh, with, with, with Dave every year there. Uh, we'll try to once again have him on after the draft. Uh, Alex and I will be back on Tuesday. And in the meantime, you can follow me on Twitter at Steeders Depot. Follow Alex on Twitter at Alex underscore Kazora. Follow the show at Terrible Podcast. Email the show, the Terrible Podcast at gmail.com. Let us know what you think about Dave, uh, Dave's appearance uh, this year on the show. Uh, also, if you'd like to donate to the cause, go to SteedersDepot.com, hit the donate button, upright navigational bar. Uh, also, if you want an ad-free version of SteedersDepot.com, you can go to SteedersDepot.com, hit the ad-free button for $25 for one calendar year. You can have an ad-free version of the site. Happy Easter, everybody. As always, thanks for listening to the Terrible Podcast with Dave and Alex. <laughs>